this uh, last few days, I went backpacking with Sharon, and uh, we hiked in a little over two days, uh, 15 miles with a heavy backpack in the Appalachian Trail, which she said was supposed to be flat, but it was not flat. But it was a great blessing. I'm so glad. I had two cups of coffee this morning, so I'm raring to go. I'm also thankful that the Lord has, uh, has got his word that drives me forward. And I've been looking at a series, Bible Verses That Changed History. Sometimes people ask me, why do we have so many different kinds of churches out there? And I think of it this way. If I was to pull out my wallet, today's a good day. I've got something in it. I've got some ones, and I got a five, and I got a 10. I might even have 120. Now, what do you call those? <laughs> They're denominations, Jim. Now, do all those bills work? We hope so. Denominations. I heard a Baptist preacher was asked one time if he said, uh, he was asked, was it only Southern Baptists that went to heaven? He said, well, I'm not sure, but why take a chance? <laughs> you know, we've had people recently in the past year or so join our church from all different backgrounds, some from Lutheran, some from Methodist, some from Presbyterian. We've got some Catholics. We've got some people from all backgrounds. I think it's important that we understand where we come from and who we are. This church that I'm the pastor of is a Baptist church. It's not a non-denominational church. Now, the difference between a denomination and a sect is a sect believes that they're the only people that have it right and that everyone else is doomed to hell. That's not what we believe, not what Baptists believe. Uh, there's, there's some good things we learn from the different groups of people and how Lord has revealed himself. And what I'm trying to do through this series is look at our history uh, that shaped us. I am moving forward. Next Sunday, I'm going to talk about the pilgrims and the Puritans. For, can you believe Thanksgiving is a week away? Better defrost the turkey today. Or you know, well, maybe not quite yet. But we're, com we're moving toward that. Today, I want to look at Hebrews 12.1. Wonderful verse. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, he's talking about in this scripture a lot of these people in the faith, in the Bible that's come. But throughout Christian history, there are people who have given their lives for God, and we're surrounded by them as well. And since we're surrounded by them, let us run with endurance. Uh, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking into Jesus, the author and finishing, finisher of our faith. Um, God is moving us forward into who we should be, and we need to follow him day by day. Um, we should lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us and move forward to what God wants us to be. Look into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, I want to look today at a few of the people in the past history who've made such a difference in the reason we're here today and from different places, different times. But before we get to that, at the end of my sermon last week, I talked about tulip. Now, I wasn't talking about a flower. I was talking about the uh, five points of what people know today is Calvinism. So I just went that, over that quickly, and there are some people that had questions. So I'm going to explain this a little more in detail, then move forward. And by the way, if you have any questions about this, feel free to call me. I'll meet with you. We're not debating this today, okay? Just let you know. All right. The five points of what we know as Calvinism came apart uh, came, came 53 years after John Calvin died. It was put together at a meeting in Dortreet Nether, in the Netherlands, a town in the Netherlands. It's called the Synod of Dort. It was a meeting that debated 
uh, one understanding of God with another understanding. Arminianists was the one understanding, and Calvin and other people were the other understanding. Today we think of Calvinism, really what you're talking about is Reformed theology. If anybody ever asks you if your church is Reformed or not, do you know what that means? There are Baptist churches that are Reformed. Well, let's talk about what does that mean. Uh, the crux of it is, is these, are these five points, and I want to go over them very briefly. First one, total depravity. It's not talking about that we're all the worst possible sinners you can be. It's talking about all of us are sinners. All of us have fallen short. You might think of it like this. What, what comes first, our decision to follow Christ or Christ moving us toward that decision? You ever heard somebody give a testimony and they say, they, they talk for 30 minutes about all the terrible things they did, and then at the end of it they say, and I made a decision to follow Christ, and I changed my life, and I turned to him, and I, I, I. You know, they're emphasizing the wrong thing. It's God who comes into our lives and saves us. It's God that gives us uh, grace. It's not by what we do. And this emphasizes this idea of total depravity. Second one, the U, is unconditional election. Now, there, there's an idea here within the Reformed theology that people have been chosen from the beginning of the world to be God's people, the elect, and that you do not really have a choice whether you follow Jesus or not. If you were chosen, that's it. And God chose, chooses who he wills because you don't have the ability to choose him. He chooses you. This goes along with the next one, which is limited atonement, this idea that Jesus only died for the elect. Jesus' blood uh, only forgives those which he has chosen. Now, this is where I differ from this. I'm a John uh, 3.16 Christian. I believe uh, God so loved the world that whoever comes to him. Whoever turns their life over to him can come to God. And this idea that you have been predestined for hell from the time you're born and there's nothing you can do to change that does not fit with my understanding of a good, loving God. I do understand there's very godly people that have different opinions. Uh, and I understand that. Uh, one day we'll get to heaven, we'll find out the, the, the real answer. The third one is irresistible grace. This goes along with this whole system of thinking is that if God chooses you, you cannot do anything but say yes. Now, we're, we, we know, there's a type of hyper-Calvinism that says this, that a pastor, if you are preaching, don't preach to people who are not the elect because it won't work. Uh, you know, I, I feel that God... We're supposed to preach to everyone, and God will put it in their heart that they will turn to him, but not that, that some cannot. And the last one of the, of the tulip is perseverance of the saints. Now, uh, this is, you might call it once saved, always saved, which we, you know, I, believe, I believe a lot of Baptists believe, the idea that once you make an authentic decision to follow Christ, you, are, you, you can't backslid and, and lose that. Now, there are people today that are, Four-point Calvinists, they believe in four of them. There are three of them. There are people who are hyper-Calvinists. There are all different flavors of this. But basically, this is what's called Reformed theology. Our church does not follow this as a whole. I do not follow this. Do we have people in the church who believe this way? Yes, we do. Does that, can we still fellowship together? Yes, we can. Uh, but, but I strongly believe that God... Uh, reaches out to us, and he loves all of us, and we need to turn to him. So that's the tulip. If you have other questions about this, feel free to talk to me later about it. I'd love to talk to you about it. I want to go back to the text that we're starting with today. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we should lay aside every weight and the sin that easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So did this person run this race. His name was William Tyndale. 
He was born in 1494. He was a brilliant young man. He was a non-noble family. He went to Oxford. He was an expert at translating from other languages. He, had a, he was a linguist of par none. Um, I got a picture of him. He, he, was, he was a great, strong man, follower of God. And like Luther, Luther felt led to get the Bible to the common person. So he translated from Latin to German up to this time, the time of Tyndale. There was no English Bible. The only Bibles were Latin. And so if you lived in England and you were a follower of God and you only had, and you didn't know Latin, which most people didn't, you had to believe whatever the Pope said or whether the bishop said, the archbishop or your priest, because you couldn't read it yourself. And so Tyndale said, that's not right. And he started talking to people about this. And uh, one of the leaders of, of the diocese, a large church in Worcester, England, he said this, and he warned him, he said, we had better be without God's law than the popes. And what he was meaning was that maybe God's laws are good, but the popes are the ones that matter. Well, Tyndale did not like that. And he said this, I defy the pope and all his laws. And if God spares my life, I will cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more about the scriptures than you do. Pretty strong, isn't it? That's what he told his pastor. He said, if I uh, succeed, I'm going to spread the Bible in words that people can understand. That was his driving mission. Now, to do that, he had to get a permit. Sounds like Williamsburg, doesn't it? He had to get a permit. To, to translate the Bible. He tried and tried and tried. They would not give him a permit. It took years and years. They wouldn't give him a permit. Guess what he did? He did it anyway. He translated it. And he went on the run. They tried to hunt him down. He translated the New Testament first, and then over time, the Old Testament. And he had these Bibles smuggled into England and Scotland. And so people would get these illegal Bibles that were in English, and they could actually read. He was condemned by the Bishop of London. Uh, he was one of the most, most wanted man, men of his day. In fact, they finally caught him in 1536. He was burned at the stake. He gave his life. And his last words were this, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Now, what he was saying was as he was dying, Lord, help James to come to, to believe that the Bible was necessary. A few years later, James changed, and he decreed that every church should have a Tyndale Bible in it. Now, what's, what's interesting about this is this is the precursor to the King James Bible. In fact, a lot of the phrases that I learned and many of you learned growing up come from the Tyndale Bible. You see, when somebody translates from the Greek and the Hebrew, they have to put it in the right word order. They have to think what's the best word to translate. I believe the Holy Spirit is involved with it. Listen to some of these phrase, phrases that come out of the Tyndale Bible. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. comes from Tyndale's translation. Twinkling of an eye. Seek, and ye shall find. Eat, Drink and be merry. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Judge not that you will not be judged. My brother's keeper, the salt of the earth, gave up the ghost, a law unto themselves, the signs of the times, live and move and have our being. Fight the good fight. These phrases come out of the Tyndale translation. In fact, when the King James Version was made, 84% of the New Testament came from the Tyndale Bible. 75.8% of the Old Testament came from the Tyndale Bible. Yet how many of us remember who Tyndale was? A man who gave his life so that we could have an English Bible, the first English Bible, and we don't even remember him. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And so... What was going on in England that caused this to be such a mess? And I want to just put this in context for just a minute. There was a reformation going on in England, just like it happened in Germany 
uh, but different in many ways. The king of England at this time was King Henry VIII. Think of him sitting there with a, a turkey leg, okay? That's what I think of when I think of uh, King Henry VIII. King, king Henry VIII, his father, who had been a very successful guy, left him a lot of wealth. He exhausted it in 10 years. He was just not a good manager, not a good king at all. He uh, married Catherine of Aragon, and uh, he married her, and one of her, well, her main job was to give him a male heir. She had eight children. All but one died when she was having them. Uh, no boys. She had one girl, Mary uh, Tudor, who survived, but all the rest died. She got to be 40 years old, and the you know, biological t- clock was ticking, and so Henry VIII said, what am I going to do? I need a successor. And so he went to the Pope and said, can you annul this wedding? Can you do away with it? Well, the Pope, you know, he should have said no because it's not ethically right, but he said no because it's not politically right. And he, did, he thought it was a wrong thing to do, and so he said no. Well, Henry VIII said, well, I'll, I'll change it then. So he said, no longer will we follow the Pope, you'll follow me. And that was the birth of the Anglican Church, the Church of England. And the Church of England has gone down, uh, it eventually becomes in this country what? The Episcopal Church. And so this is part of the history of their church and uh, how that, that came through. i got a picture here. This was all King Henry VIII's wives. He had six of them. He had two of them killed. It wasn't a good job to be his wife. Uh, he thought that they were uh, running around on him. One of them may have been. But uh, he, he was a guy that was definitely not um, uh, what you want. Um, but this was the environment in which Tyndale was persecuted. Now, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, I want to move forward and talk some of the other great people uh, Uh, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance that which is set before us. And so I want to talk about John Knox. What Luther did in Germany, John Knox did in Scotland. John Knox was born. um, He was not raised as a noble person. He was raised as a peasant. uh, But he was a very bright person. He had a good education. And uh, when he was in school, one of his profe- we're shaped by different things. And one of his professors was a follower of Luther. And when people in Scotland who were, who were big followers of the Pope, when they found that out, his professor was burned at the stake. That'll get your attention as a young man, won't it? And uh, so John Knox went on. To, um, he went on and became an assistant of one of the great preachers in his day. And uh, this, this preacher would go around, uh, his name, uh, I have it right here, it's a lot to, to get through, let's see. Um, anyway, Patrick Hamilton, and Patrick Hamilton was the one that was uh, burned at the stake, that was his professor. George Weishart was the, pa- the pastor that he became the bodyguard for. for. And he was the bodyguard of George Weishart. And he was a man who loved God, Weishart was. And the plague hit this town. And the Catholic um, folks would not go into town, would not, the, the people who were in charge of that diocese wouldn't have nothing to do with that. But this man, he came in, Weishart did, and he helped them, and he came alongside them and did so many good things for them. But, he was, a, he was a Protestant. He was a fo- follower of Martin Luther. And so Cardinal, there was a Cardinal who was not a very good man at all, Cardinal Beaton, and he had this man, Weishart, arrested in the middle of the night, tried him for 10 minutes, and then he had him burned at the stake. And when the Scottish people found out this good man of God was killed that way, they were irate about it. And so two of the Scottish noblemen, decided they would sneak into St. Andrews. Some of you might know St. Andrews as a golf course. St. Andrews is a university. It's a university in Scotland, a great university. And these two Scottish nobles broke into St. Andrews to find this cardinal. 
And um, they asked the person that worked there in the, in the evening, where, which one is his room? And uh, the cardinal, the man that worked there said, I'm not going to tell you because I don't want them to come after me for telling you. But I will tell you this, he's having an affair with a woman and she's been sneaking into his room every night. So if he just hide out here, eventually she'll come out of the room and that's the room he's in. That's what they did. They had out there at night, and in the middle of the night, this woman came out of the room, and they went in there, and that was a cardinal, and they killed him. And after that happened, somebody thought that John Knox had done it. And so they took John Knox, they arrested him, they put him on a galley, rowing. And so he was put in a terrible situation for a long time, rowing as a galley, a slave, really, and uh, he eventually moved out of that and went to Geneva and studied under John Calvin and did some other things. I got a picture of him. He was a fine guy. Uh, I got a couple of pictures of him. That's one. The next picture shows you whenever you see a picture of Knox preaching, he's got his fist out like this because he was a very powerful preacher. He didn't care who it was. This next one is a wax figure of him in a museum. Imagine if I was like that every Sunday. John Knox didn't care who it was. He was going to tell you the truth. He was a man. In fact, on his grave, it said this. This is his epitaph. Here lies one who feared God so much that he never feared the face of any man. And he preached against uh, what was going wrong. And under his leadership, the country of Scotland moved out of Roman Catholicism, but not into Anglicanism, but into um, uh, Presbyterianism. And we have Presbyterian churches that go all the way back then. So that's John Knox. Continuing, therefore also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Another group of people, the Anabaptists. Sounds like Baptist, doesn't it? Do you know what Anna means? It means again. This name was given to them as a slander. You see, up until this time, everybody that was baptized for hundreds of years was baptized as a baby. Even though in the New Testament, there, you know, people were baptized as adults, uh, that was not going on. And if you were in Germany or if you were in one of these other countries and you were born and you had Christian parents, they baptized you as children. It's just what you did. It's one of their sacraments. That you, that's what, what you did with a child. Well, there were some folks that looked at what the Bible said and said, no, it seems like to me that people had to decide for themselves something that we call believers what? Baptism. That you have to be, which we believe in this church, you have to be, as we don't baptize infants, we believe it should be an age of accountability when each person decides to follow Christ. And so I have a picture here where they were baptizing. Uh, it began uh, with just two, um, and it continued. Uh, the first baptism was January 21st of 1524. Now, do you think that uh, people in the Catholic Church appreciated this? No, they did not. In fact, they tortured them for their beliefs. I've got a picture here of they drowned many Anabaptists. They said basically, okay, you want water? You can get it. And they would drown them for their beliefs. I have read accounts uh, of one woman. Uh, her husband had been uh, burned at the stake because he, would ref he and her refused to baptize their oldest daughter, and she was pregnant at the time. They waited until she had the baby, and they, then they burned her at the stake. And I've read the diary in which she writes to her newborn daughter, and she says, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there to raise you, but I believe in standing up for what the Bible teaches, and so I, I, I will go the way of others who have given their life to God. Now, uh, these people are not completely directly descendants, or, or we're not descendants of theirs. Uh, there was many groups of Anabaptists, but we are descendants from their idea of baptism and how central that is. 
We believe baptism is very important in this church and that it's something that we should do and you should do when you're old enough to understand what you're doing. Some of the things about Anabaptists that I'm going to go over quickly, first of all, they believed in what you might call primitivism. That means that they looked at the Bible, especially the book of Acts, not as descriptive but as prescriptive. And so if it's in there, it means we should do it the same exact way. They believed in passivism, no wars, no soldiers, no violence. Out of Anabaptists uh, came the Amish, uh, the Quakers, came a lot of groups like that. Uh, They were anti-society. In other words, um, if you did not agree, if you did not abide by their laws, that you were shunned, you were put out, you'd be, be out from amongst them. Uh, They were anti-tradition. They did not like to have a lot of symbols in the room, candles. They didn't even like music. Uh, They didn't believe in have anti-hierarchy. They didn't have pastors. They didn't have bishops. They would come together and just have a time of silence. And if somebody felt the Lord lead them, that person would speak. And out of them comes the Quakers, the Seekers, uh, a lot of different groups. And... and, um, I look at these people and I think, you know, what people of faith they were. There were people who had great faith and they risked a lot to to follow God. And I think in my life, well, how much have I actually uh, risked? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which we get entangled with. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. These are just some of the people that have come before us that have been examples to us in our faith. And out of their work has come churches like the Lutheran Church and the Presbyterian Church and the uh, many different denominations. We're, we're all, in a way, indebted to some of their faithfulness. Uh, And I don't know what God is going to call us to do, but I do know that we can look at these people and they should inspire us to be faithful no matter what. When I look at John Knox, it gives me courage. God strengthened him, even though he went through such oppression. And I pray that God will strengthen you. I look at Sharon Gauthier, who's going through such hard times, and yet she's a person of such great faith. It strengthens me. I pray that we will strengthen each other like iron sharpens iron to be who God's called us to be. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ, that came to give us new life. And Lord, we look at those in the past that came before us, And we are so thankful for how you use them in such powerful ways. We thank you for their courage and their convictions. And we pray that you would keep us to be people of courage and conviction as well. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you give us freely. I pray that we would turn to you every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.